Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is James Moore, and I'm excited to host uh, our conversation today with two excellent authors and uh, two of their exciting books. Uh, I'm going to just open up with a little housekeeping uh, and welcome, and then I'll introduce our authors, and then we'll get started with the, the conversation. So um, again, welcome to the 33rd Annual Southern Festival of Books, um, and on behalf of Humanities of Tennessee. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook Live or YouTube and want to ask any questions during the session, uh, please do so in the chat, and a staff person will make sure I get them and we'll, we'll get them into our conversation. Um, a huge thank you to Parnassus, who is our bookseller. Um, your purchases through Parnassus help to keep this festival free, uh, and you can also support the festival uh, in the app that, that you might be using or at uh, www h u m t n dot org. Uh, so that's that's our housekeeping for today. Um, and I want to talk a little bit uh, about our authors and who, these two great books. Uh, so I uh, will start and I'll do it alphabetically with uh, George Ann Eubanks. Um, so George Ann is the author of Saving the Wild South: The Fight for Native Plants on the Brink of Extinction. Uh, just released by the University of North Carolina Press. Uh, her last book, The Month of Their Ripening North Carolina Heritage Foods Through the Year, was also issued in paperback this August. Um, she's also the author of the classic three-volume Literary Trails of North Carolina series, commissioned by the North Carolina Arts Council and published by the UNC Press. So since 2000, George Ann has been a principal with Donna Campbell in the Minnow Media LLC, an Emmy-winning multimedia production company that primarily creates independent documentaries for public television. Um, George Ann has served as president of Arts North Carolina, chair of the North, uh, North Carolina Humanities Council, and is immediate past president of the North Carolina Literary and Historical Association. She also directs the Table Rock White Writers Workshop, an annual conference of writers held in the Blue Ridge Mountains at Wild Acres Retreat. Uh, so welcome to George Ann. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, our next author is Cynthia Kaufman. So Cynthia is the director of the, and I apologize if I mispronounce this, <laughs> Fosca mm -hmm. Stelos Institute for Democracy and Action, uh, Danza College, uh, where she runs and teaches in a community organizer training program. Um, she's the author of four books on social change, including the one uh, that we're going to be talking about today, The Sea is Rising and So Are We, a climate justice handbook out with PM Press uh, this year, 2021. Uh, she's been active in a wide variety of social justice movements, including Central American solidarity, union organizing, police accountability, and most recently, tenants' rights, transit justice, and climate change. She publishes on social justice and common dreams uh, and received her PhD and MA and uh, master's in philosophy from UMass Amherst and her bachelor's in development studies from UC Berkeley. Um, so welcome to Cynthia and I'm glad to have you both here. And um, the, the, a quick note on format, I mean, today our authors will be uh, kind of, it's a conversation. So they'll be offering questions to each other in dialogue. Um, and I will, uh, if, if we get audience questions, or, um, you know, I'll be supporting from my end. So um, please go ahead and again, welcome to both of you. All right, thanks so much, James. All right, so I have the first one, which is, um, George Ann, when I read your book, I was so struck by, you know, that you're talking about native plants, but it's so much about not just saving those plants, but the communities, and one gets a real sense of the importance of people knowing their place and feeling their place. And one of the concepts you talk about is, plant blindness, the idea that people just don't even see the plants about them around them. So I just wanted to ask you both kind of just a quick summary of what's your book about, but then also, you know, why is it important for people to have a sense of the place where they live? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Cynthia. It's a real honor to be with you in this conversation. Um, I appreciate your work, long years of work, and and the friendliness of your book and mm -hmm. the invitation for people to become active, which I think was kind of what happened for me, all the books that I have written for UNC Press that James mentioned are about place and the impact of place on our identity as humans and on knowing where we come from uh, and 
So the first three books on literary North Carolina were very much about what our state's authors had written about place in North Carolina. <clears throat> three volume series, 10 years it took to do that. Then I moved to eating my way across North Carolina and <laughs> learning about the importance of place to food and the special foods and the ephemeral quality of delicious uh, foods and, and meat and fish and so forth uh, that had become part of North Carolina's history. In the process of doing that book, I learned that there were oysters in danger, there were ramps which had become gone from obscurity as a Cherokee native dish to something that chefs were buying and, uh, and using, and then people were starting to sell these ramps and charging high prices and pull them up, and the ramps were endangered, the oysters were endangered. And I started thinking about, you know, heck, who I am as a person who's always lived in the South is very much informed by the plants that I learned to love from my grandmother mm -hmm. and the foods that I learned to eat that were grown here. Um, they're part of my identity and I know they're parts of the identity of other peoples, African-Americans, native people. And so I wanted to explore in depth a dozen endangered or rare plants that have a story to tell us about ourselves and the people who are trying to save them, the people who are really committed. So this is a book of 12 stories. It's on the ground. Um, and it's uh, it's also about climate because climate is also a part of what we can grow here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, uh, how, Cynthia, we talked a little bit, but tell me about how place informs your book on climate activism. Good. Yeah, thanks. So uh, my book, I actually start with a story of, uh, of a place that's just between me and the, and the ocean right here in California. And, you know, uh, sometimes when people think about the climate crisis, it's like it's both everywhere and nowhere, right? In other words, you know, what we admit here, you know, causes problems elsewhere and what people, you know, so it's, and so one of the things I like to think about is that, there's an expression I really like, which is to change everything, you can start anywhere, you know, and so I start with with a, a beautiful restoration project that happened in a, in a piece of land that was completely destroyed and was slated for a freeway and local folks fought against that freeway expansion and then the federal government took it over and planted native plants and now it's just an amazing place where huge wide diversity of people come from I'm near San Francisco come from San Francisco and enjoy the beach and enjoy the landscape and just have a real sense of belonging so so I can I think there's a couple of things one is one is that we all live places that can be made more hospitable hospitable for human and, and natural life and that the forces that are sort of destroying the environment um, kind of encroach on our places and so protecting places and, and having a sense of home and belonging is, is really important for that. So when I, um, and just to give a quick overview, you know, my book is basically everything you need to know to be a climate activist. Because one of the things I think with climate work is because it's everywhere and nowhere, because it's being pushed by forces that are so much bigger than us, because so much of what has to happen is large scale, but a lot of it's also small scale and a lot of it's local. So the point of my book is here's all the great things people are doing to address the climate change crisis, you should know about them. Here's all the policy things you need to be doing and you can be doing. Here's how to have it work in your life. It's pretty much everything you need to know to be ready to really engage in the fight of our lives that has to make, we have to make huge, huge progress within the next 10 years or we're cooked as a species. So, so I really, so that's what the book is about. It's a ramp up. So Georgian, I wanted to ask you also about um, why why are native plants important? Like, why should people know about that? Mm -hmm. Well, besides the identity issue, um, native plants are living here for a reason. They thrive in the particular environments in which they are native. And you know, over the years uh, in the South, we have brought in a lot of uh, non-native plants, some of which are invasive invasive. In the early part of the 20th century, Florida was a place where people were bringing in plants and experimenting to see if they would grow here as potential crops. And some were like mangoes and avocados, things we certainly shouldn't complain about. And they grow well in California and in Hawaii as well. 
Uh, but there were other plants that became invasive and birds would disperse the seeds and then suddenly they were choking out our native plants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we uh, in the in the nursery business are often sold plants that don't that may thrive here, but they're not from here. And there's a danger in the importation of other plants that that will end up damaging what grows best here. Um, native plants uh, really have suffered mostly from, you know, the conversion of habitat mm -hmm. to cities and to farms and to roads and and they ruin the relationship. This this development ruins the relationship between pollinators and seed dispersals. A seed dispersing animals and uh, and our our plants, and so we get ourselves into trouble. And suddenly, just like the chain food movement, we don't know where we are because yeah. everything looks the same. And I, you know, James, some landscapers tend to have a very small palette of plants that are not native to where they plant them, and that's kind of unfortunate uh, because. Uh, what makes us special are the things that make us distinctive, and and those plants are are part of that. Um, we've had extraction mining in the south, agriculture, tree farms, trees planted so close together, nothing can survive in the understory, and we've lost some of our coniferous plants and the beautiful pitcher plants in Alabama were under threat because of that kind of of uh, uh, agriculture. We've had. Um, a loss of Native American wisdom uh, mm -hmm. about burning. You know, the South used to have a lot of open land that was prairie. We don't think of the South as having prairies, but we did. And that seed bank is still underground. And when you do a controlled burn of a place that is not cluttered with trees, you'll find out what the native plants are underground. It's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. So, and then finally, and this is really kind of mind boggling, but poachers mm -hmm. of rare and endangered plants, the commodification of rare and endangered plants has become a huge issue. It's the fourth largest criminal enterprise in the world, wow. the um, selling of animals and plants on the black market, following drug smuggling, counterfeiting, and human trafficking, which is just astonishing mm -hmm. to think about. Wow. So, yeah. Use the word commodification. When I think about what we're up against with the climate crisis, it's a similar kind of set of things, right? Which is that sort of the idea that um, that we want to have a life where we're organizing our society in ways that meet our human needs. But when it becomes when when you you know I I do talk about kind of capitalism and the profit motive as part of what we're up against with this. Because when we think about the climate crisis, you know, it is true that there's new technology that's coming in and solving our problems, right? Like solar, wind, you know, uh, trying to use less energy, be more efficient and all that. But those things actually aren't going to save us as long as we let that commodification, that profit motive keep driving social decisions. One of the things I've been real involved with is the fossil fuel divestment movement. And the reason for that is we have to understand that there are some large companies whose profits are at our expense and they control our political systems and we're not going to get to where we need to get to to have a sustainable world if we don't take away their political power and so that's sort of the idea of everything becoming a commodity so that word you use commodification is one of my favorite words right that we have to really understand how our relationships with each other our relationship with the earth our relationship with politicians, everything gets to be bought and sold and then we can't kind of create the sort of good thriving society that we all want for ourselves. And as I said to you, here we are trying to sell books, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, no, but uh, I, yeah uh, at least for me, you make your living as an author. I'm, I, I make my living working for the state at, at, a, at a college, so I'm happy to give it away for free. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's a real advantage. Well, um, you are so optimistic in this book. Um, I think the climate crisis, as you said, is so big and so, there are so many pieces. It's easy to just lose heart. And that's partly why I picked one little narrow piece of land and mm -hmm. 12 plants on that piece of land and the people who are working with them. But what, what gives you optimism? Cynthia? Yeah. So one of my favorite expressions uh, comes from a, a philosopher named Gramsci. He was an Italian uh, anti-fascist was, is the idea that you should have pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And what that means is 
you've got to open your eyes and see just how terrible it is, right? Because if you pretend things are fine, you're not going to see what's happening around you. So you have to open your eyes. But then it's almost like what they say in mindfulness meditation retreats, put your attention on where you can make a difference, right? So for me, I sort of live by that philosophy. It's like, yeah, the ice caps are melting. Yeah, this terrible, like there's all kinds of terrible things happening and that's not where I spend my day to day. I spend my day to day in the places where I can make a difference. So that's one piece of the optimism. And, um, you know, and, and actually that's how I keep myself healthy. And I know you wanted to talk about that too, is just where can I make a difference? And then the other part is, you know, people who are not involved in the climate crisis are, kind of often sit back and get like, ah, the world is falling apart and nobody's doing anything. Well, the truth is a lot of people, millions of people are doing a lot, right? We are in the middle of probably the biggest transformation in world history. And it may not go fast enough to save us, but it's happening, right? Solar and wind are already cheaper than fossil fuels. Um, every institution, you know, James is at Vanderbilt. I don't know if you have a story to tell about that, but you know, every college and university and elementary school I know is figuring out how to reduce, you know, their, their, uh, their carbon usage. Everybody everywhere is reweaving the social fabric. So my optimism is about knowing about those good things, keeping my eyes open to the terrible, but really focusing my attention on where I can make a difference. And I never really understood about plant blindness until I started this book. And uh, I'm encouraged to hear people talking about that now. It was about 2006 when that phrase was uh, introduced to the academy by a couple of scholars in the South, actually, who studied high school graduates and asked them what they knew about plants. And there was some phenomenal percentage of high school graduates who had never planted a plant in their entire life. They had never seen a movie that really put plants at the fore. And what the investigation continued to show was that kids kind of see the big green backdrop around us mm -hmm. as just, it could be plastic, right? right. And we've also know uh, from much farther back that people, humans tend to gravitate toward animals more than plants. They are drawn emotionally uh, to, to animals. And in fact, in the creation of the Endangered Species Act, uh, animals were the only focus for nearly a decade. And then they added 3,000 endangered plants to the list. Um, and still in the funding that goes on, plants re receive the short end of the stick. You know, we see all the, the zoos and the cute fuzzy animals and there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to attend to the plants because guess what? Those animals can't live without plants for food. Um, so, I decided that I really wanted to encourage parents and grandparents to take their kids to these botanical gardens and to places where they can see these plants and begin to know them and name them. Uh, when my grandmother, who was a great gardener, died, there was a beautiful spread of wildflowers. Oops, Georgiana. You could name every flower on her cactus. Oh. I'm a back. You're back. You said uh, when your grandmother died. Okay. Yeah. When she died, there was a beautiful spread of wildflowers on her casket. And my aunt turned to me and said, you know, mama could name every plant on her casket and the Latin name. And I think we've lost some of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And our kids need to know about plants, what they are, especially in our, where they grow up. I think that's the best place to start. So I'm really writing this book for people like me who are not botanists. I'm not an expert. This is not a highly technical book. It's about emotional reaction to beautiful plants and the curious stories mm -hmm. that led to their discovery and to their uh, demise. Yeah, that's so. so wonderful. You know, I want to throw it back at you with a... Um, one of the things I loved in reading your book was that thing about uh, bringing people into into a, a, a better, you know, more thriving relationship with nature and also about people of color. So one of the things that you and I dialogued about a little bit was the role of race in our work. And, I, you know, I, I'm very I, I know people here in California who do work on the idea that sort of um, for all kinds of historical reasons, 
wilderness nature is like a white people thing, right? And that people of color have been often excluded from, from, uh, from deep connections that they've, of course, historically always had with nature. So I just wanted to ask you that about kind of how does, how does race play in your work? Well, possibly nowhere more dramatically than in the South is nature white space. And I spent some time in Alabama talking to the Cahaba River Society, which is a group that was founded by white folks because they love the Cahaba River that flows through Birmingham and down South. And it's still an unimpounded river. And there are beautiful lilies that bloom on it every year between Mother's Day and Father's Day. And it's a big tourist attraction. But they discovered as they began to invite members of the African-American community into their classes and their canoe trips that folks didn't want to go into nature, that their associations with the Cahaba River were actually the Cahaba River boys who were the ones who uh, perpetrated the murder of the young Sunday school students in Birmingham, that terrible tragedy. And of course, lynching. People were hung from trees. So how would you feel about going into the forest if your people had been traumatized for a century by the sight of people hanging in trees? So Brian Stevenson, the Equal Justice Project and the, um, the National Museum for Peace and Justice that addresses lynching straight on has helped to break down some barriers. And now there are discussions about how can we enjoy nature as a larger community. And uh, so the Cahaba River Society is doing a great job of that. The Atlanta Botanical Garden founded by nice white ladies of means uh, <laughs> in the mid 20th century has now got some very uh, driven leadership to incorporate that very diverse city into the care and protection of the trees that really define that city. So beautiful. So. So that's happening. And um, there are Native Americans working on the front lines of restoring their own food sovereignty, which involves plants that are now endangered. Um, and also the Cherokee, you know, are, are famous for their river cane baskets. And there's only 2% of the river cane left in the South that used to be there. So making a basket is kind of a environmental challenge. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of ways that uh, race and and uh, the differences, the different cultures of the South have an avenue to address some of those things in a beautiful way with nature. You know, when I think about race in my book, um, there's a way that there's a sort of a stereotype of environmentalists as white people and that the purpose of environmentalism is to save wild nature, right? And so there's been a huge shift in framing around that to, to, to put the concept of environmental justice forward. And so my book, I, you know, is a climate justice handbook, meaning that, you know, that I, that I really use that framing that's kind of emerged from, from uh, communities of color and their activism. And, you know, when you think about the climate crisis, the, the, the vast majority of fossil fuel extraction, at least in California, I think is probably true throughout the, this country, is uh, located near communities of color. When you think about, you know, urban communities here locally near me in Oakland, there is a freeway that doesn't allow trucks because it's a freeway that goes through a white community, but the freeway that goes through the black community has lots and lots of diesel trucks. And so the incidences of asthma in that community is just huge. So when we think about moving to the the sustainable world that we're all working to build that's a world that has much more racial justice in it and then the, the one of the things that people say about climate change is that it's a threat multiplier meaning you know if you're if you're poor and you're like the fires in california you know you have a fire and it destroys a community if you're relatively wealthy you had insurance and you owned your home and so fema would come in and you could get a new home and it would actually i mean it cost you a lot emotionally but it wouldn't cost you financially, whereas the fires that happened last year uh, in Sonoma County, just north of me, people who were renters lost everything. They just lost everything. People who were underinsured lost everything. So there are so many places like that where the kind of race and class justice issues 
get just multiplied by the crises. And so, and then also if you look at the surveys of who cares about the climate crisis, you have actually much more support for strong action in communities of color than you do in white communities. And so it's just a kind of an interesting set of paradoxes that there's a, that there's some stereotypes around the work. And so then for those of us who are white doing the work, we have to really be careful to make sure we don't frame the work as white work and just let kind of race go unmentioned. Well, and here on the East Coast, the hurricanes that we've had, the rivers rising, have tended to affect low-lying, low-income, often African-American communities the worst. And of course, environmental racism, the dumping of toxic waste, et cetera. It's an it's a issue that can't be denied anymore because of the climate, the, the drastic climate uh, effects that we've experienced in the East. And of course, New Orleans is another example. Yeah. Um, but I want to hear more, Cynthia, from you about um, engaging as an activist and how that can be good for your mental health um, and your <laughs> philosophy of coalition building. Yeah. OK. Um, make sure I get the coalition part. So the mental health piece, you know, it's interesting in, in the work that I'm doing around fossil fuel divestment. Um, we have a lot of teachers because we're trying to get the teacher's pension system to divest. And one of the teachers in that work has has done a, a lot to to share with us research that shows I me mean, think about it, if you're a child right now and you're in school and and you hear that the climate crisis is happening and you hear that if we don't do drastic things in 10 years, we're sunk and then the adults around you aren't talking about it that makes the kids crazy right i mean it's really really damaging for our children to have us not mention these things that are so crucial so so there's a kind of an anxiety that comes and so people talk a lot actually about the sort of the mental health effects of climate anxiety and so I have found for myself personally, and I also think this is true for lots of people, that if the world is on fire and everybody's sitting around watching TV, that's a little painful, right? But if you're hanging around with the people who are not just sitting around, I mean, we also watch TV, but you know, not just sitting around watching TV, but that they're actually engaged with it, then you feel like you're part of something really good that's happening to build a better world and that you're not in denial, right? So for me, just as a person, I grew up in a family that had a lot of, I would say denial and silence and so for me as an adult that that feels really toxic and it feels really healthy to me to be around people who will just casually say yeah we're in trouble this is hard what are we going to do about it but then that's not crazy making right then we're in a kind of an authentic alignment with the real stuff that's around us and then the coalition building tell me what you thought was interesting that you read about the coalition building i just wasn't quite sure what you were what you were asking me about there well it's just the willingness to walk work across differences and to find the places that people connect uh it seems yeah. we've we've sort of alluded to that but Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love that. So, you know, one of my favorite, there's a wonderful article by Bernice Johnson Reagan, who's, you know, one of the Sweet Honey in the Rock um, yeah. uh, uh, people, anyhow, about coalitions. And she says, sometimes when you do political work, you do it in your home, meaning with people who are very similar to you, you get along easy. When you say one quick thing, they know exactly what you mean. But most important political work, you're outside of home and you're in coalition, meaning you're working with people who you don't necessarily have a lot in common with. Um, and that requires, what can I say, generosity, grace, listening, you know, all those kind of things. And, and for me, you know, I teach community organizing. And one of my big things is let's really be strategic, right? Let's really think about what can we do and where can we put our energy that's going to have a significant, significant impact. We're not doing this to feel good about ourselves. We're not doing this for our image. We're doing this because we need, need, need to make a difference. And that might put you in relationship with folk who are not maybe your folk, right? You know, and so, and so, you know, I, so I think we can't let our sort of aesthetics of the kind of politics we like, the kind of person we want to be, get in the way of making those crucially important decisions about where to put the energy we have in this very few years we have into places that may not be comfortable, but that are necessary for making that difference. Can I ask you, Georgia, well, about that, sure. about the sort of like the, 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 who's actively working to make a difference in saving the native native plants where you are and kind of what that what that work looks like and what are what are people doing and what people can do yeah well so the i mentioned the botanical gardens and the native plant societies who are working in concert to save seeds and genetic material 
and who are out planting endangered species in places that it's legal to plant them and they'll be protected. But it's a really small community and they all know each other. And so it's actually been wonderful to travel around the South to these six states that I cover in the book and meet folks who all know the other folks I've visited. And while it's a small community, um, it's nice to kind of pull the curtain up on them because they're working, they're very, they're very devoted to science. You know, they're, these folks for the most part are really about the science. There are a few landowners and others who are volunteering to let things be planted on their land and so forth. But um, it's, it's just, it is a community that people should know is out there uh, in this region and they're working hard. Um, the one thing that I, I want people to know as well is that there are still plants being discovered yeah. that um, it's because of the biodiversity of the South that there's a higher number of species at risk here. And E.O. Wilson, who's a distinguished Harvard uh, biologist and from Alabama says that he figures that we have discovered and recorded perhaps only 20% of all species on the planet. I had no idea. I thought science had done it all, right? Mm -hmm. So not true. Um, we visited a mining site in Alabama where 61 rare species were discovered in one place growing in the ruins of an ironworks that was built during the Civil War. And of those 61 plants that were discovered, eight had never been seen before. That's mind boggling to me. In the smallest rural county in Alabama on the Little Cahaba River, and that was in 2006. Wow. So we don't even know what we're losing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just huge to me and something that uh, could be a very interesting line of study, particularly for kids, for high school yeah. students and for college students. Unfortunately, programs in botany are on de in decline. Mm -hmm. It's not all bad. People are going into ecology and environmental sciences and conservation, but the basics of botany are not being taught in the way they used to be. And that's that's a bit of a concern. Yeah. Georgia, and one of the things that you talk about in your book too, is so it's that a piece of protecting the plants is about learning about them, knowing about them, caring about them, not having blindness and seeing them. And then some of that's policy work too, right? In other right. words, you know, and so I think about, um, when I think about what people can do for the climate crisis, people often focus just on their personal, you know, eating less meat, flying less, et cetera, which of those things are good things to do. But really it's, it, if we're gonna get where we need to get, it needs to be much bigger than that. And so it needs to be, you know, some of some of the stories you tell in the book are, you know, about a, maybe, a, you know, a development or so, something like that, right? So, so there's often uh, uh, people trying to build things or destroy things or, you know, things like that, that we can sort of all get involved in that more political way. And I think it's important that people do take it to that political level where you, you know, try to engage your legislators in passing laws or, or defeating laws or, you know, promoting projects or, you know, stopping other projects. That, that kind of policy stuff, which is outside a lot of people's comfort zones, we really, really need to be involved. Yeah. Well, there are native, uh, the Georgia Native Plant Conservation Network. It was the sort of grandmother of a bunch of state organizations that are coalitions of nonprofits, of in industry, of nurseries, pe of people across the spectrum for whom their, their business or their lives are touched by these rare plants. So, um, so that work is, is of coalition building is happening and pressure at the state level uh, for policies mm -hmm. is, is happening. But I think at the individual level. Oh, you froze again at the individual. In the last chapter, the last chapter of my book offers some ways that individuals can get involved and one of those is sort of at the policy level, which is to encourage um, our community leaders to recognize the value of the native plants that define who we are and use that as an asset as we promote who we are as a city or a town or a county um, and recognize the role that plays. Right. I, I, I might jump in with a question. This is just, I've loved hearing this and I, I forgot to mention too, I, I'm the campus landscape architect at Vanderbilt. So just wanted to acknowledge how exciting it was to read both of your books um, and 
it's given me a lot to think about how we can contribute um, with our own university's campus. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I was curious, just as, as writers, and to hear a little bit about the process you all went through, what, what writing these books was like, um, you know, how it might have been different from other books you had written in the past. Uh, Georgian, you're a more serious writer than me, so why don't you answer that question first? Well, I am a writer. I'm not a botanist. I did take a biology class in college, and that was it. Uh, so it was a terrifying process, James. Uh, first, uh, first, I declared my ignorance at every opportunity to the people I interviewed and let them uh, check me up on facts. And I hope, I'm sure they're going to be errors uh, because I don't, but I did have some good readers, some very good readers. So I think they caught me when I was <laughs> simplifying too much, but I really wanted to keep it simple. My process and my process on all my books was discovery, travel and discovery to be curious and to learn what I didn't know about. And that that was the driving force that kept it interesting to me. This was not a term paper. This was a storytelling assignment uh, for me to meet people and meet them where they are and learn what I could learn and try to share that experience of discovery with my readers. So I hope I've achieved that. And it's a wonderful format for writing a book. It kept me interested and I hope it'll keep readers interested. That's so interesting. You know, the discovery, I, for me, I have two books that I wrote and actually three books that I wrote that, that started with, I don't understand how such and such works. Like, I just don't get it, right? And so then the whole process of the book was figuring, answering those questions and writing that process of discovery as I answer the question. So I really love writing that way as a process of discovery and inquiry. So it's my own reading about, thinking about, talking about, asking about, making sense of. This book for me wasn't that though. This book for me was because I, I am a climate justice activist and I spent a lot of my time on that. I have been writing kind of short blog kind of pieces. So I publish in Common Dreams, just, you know, something seems troubling to me and I think about it and I'm like, people should be talking about this. And I write a quick little piece and throw it out there, right? So I do a lot of that kind of writing. And I suddenly realized like, I need to be, put my writing energy into the climate crisis because I'm all in on the climate crisis right now. So I basically just pulled my little blog pieces together and kind of added a little bit of stretchy, continuous stuff to, to make it make sense. So uh, the book came together incredibly quickly for me. It really was just like, okay, what do you need to know? This is what you need to know. Yeah, I had the great fortune too of living in Chapel Hill and interviewing the uh, director of the herbarium at the University of North Carolina Botanical Gardens. And, you know, I thought, God, he's a nice guy. And he, I said, so here's my list of plants I'm thinking about. What do you think? And he said, yeah. And he told me a few stories. And he, I don't think he changed. He, he maybe suggested I had more than 12. And then as I started traveling around the South and trying to learn about these plants, I learned that this guy is like the rock star of botany in the South. And he didn't act that way. I didn't know it. And then suddenly I was like, oh, my I was so lucky to begin with him. <laughs> so serendipity. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I do. And I think we mentioned this a little, you mentioned this a little earlier on. I often find climate to be so overwhelming, but both of your books gave really accessible ways to enter into thinking about how yeah. personal action could be get right. You're almost like paralyzed by like, where do I even yeah. start? Um, so, you know, George and the stories, and the, you know, it's great to hear these people who have found ways in, uh, how they can contribute and Cynthia, you know, your book was so welcoming about, um, how anyone could start to find, in fact, like one of your chapters really is, I mean, almost focused on like, how can you find your way in, right? Yeah. Yeah, that chapter is sort of finding your people because, you know, we do all have certain kind of people we like to hang out in certain with in certain kinds of actions that we like to engage in. So how do you kind of find your right place? Yet, yeah, no, and it's true with the climate crisis, I think one of the things that um, I have also a whole chapter on messaging because there's a way that people talk about it that's very uninviting, right? It's just like doom, 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 doom. And if you just say that, people are like, ah, I hope it goes away, you know? And so then how do you open that space to be realistic about, I mean, I do use the word climate crisis. It is a crisis, it is urgent. How do you talk about that while also saying, but we need you and we can, and it's going to be fun and it's going to be interesting and it's going to be enriching and you can make a difference. You know, when I, when I um, 
teach students in my community organizer training program, there's always a moment where people go from like, I didn't really understand. Now I understand how big the problems are. Now I feel like I need, and now I feel like I have some agency and I can make a difference. Now I feel like I need to do everything all at once. And so now I'm totally overwhelmed and devastated. So there's a lot of, I would say sort of emotional landmines that you got to work your way around. So I always tell them, just find your place and do your work. You know, just find your place and do your work and feel like you're on a team of millions around the work, world that are doing this work because there are. There are millions. Yeah, and as you point out, we have a way to connect at lightning speed now. So yeah. we really can connect and share our findings, our successes, our setbacks. And, and that's that's a great thing. Yeah, that's right. But even just sort of opening your heart to knowing that, right, that I am part of this giant team and I don't need to carry it all. I'm just going to carry my piece. I'm going to carry my piece as best as I can. So I just think those, yeah, I, I think it's really important for people to find their happiness in, in doing this work. When you said happiness, I, I think, too, again, the, the thing that I got from both of the books was that the climate work or this kind of work can be joyful. You know, I mean, it's not just a hard slot. I mean, there's hard parts. Uh, but it's important to re remember the the work and the goal are not just austerity or, you know, yeah. um, scraping and saving and living a, a lesser life, that it actually can be a way forward to a fuller life. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that. Because also that whole thing about, um, you know, I think that the life that we're moving towards, you know, that 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 we if we is a much better life. Oh, my goodness. You think about a life where people work so many hours and just grind, grind, grind. And, you know, and their communities are all sort of, you know, run by Walmart. It's like that's not a great life. Right. We can recapture our communities, our sense of togetherness. I really do. You know, I'm a sort of utopia. Right. Like I really think about that world. And that world that we're moving towards is a much better world. Oh, my gosh. We, you know, we have, again, you know, we should all be consuming less. But that doesn't mean just like, oh, now we have to have crummy stuff. It means we don't need to feel bad that our house is only as big as our house is, right? You have a little house, that's fine. You know, right? There's, there's a sense of unsatisfaction that, that happens with the kind of current way things are. I think the pandemic has also uh, expedited that awareness for me. And I think for others of what we need and don't need, mm -hmm. uh, what we can do differently. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned that you were so glad to be on this call because you didn't have to fly from California, which you rarely do because of your convictions. Right. And um, I, I just think that we're all more aware, at least, or at least I am, and I think my friends are, uh, of, of how it can be different. And so we can practice some of that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm curious to hear, uh, and uh, if if you have an answer to this, but um, what if is there a, a kind of a next project? Is there kind of an extension of the work? You know, I mean, obviously, yeah. I know you, you've just got this book, so <laughs> I don't. No, no, I do. <laughs> I do. Actually, one of the, um, I am working on a book called Enough. I'm looking for a publisher, by the way, don't have one yet. But it's, it is actually about this thing we were just talking about, the idea that there can be enough for nature, there can be enough that nobody's in poverty, and those people who are middle class who never feel satisfied can find a way to have enough. And so one of the things I kind of have figured out in the, the research on that, because that was like, why do people always feel like they don't have enough? It has a lot to do with inequality has a lot to do with people being too busy to just enjoy life. Anyhow, that's my new project. Okay, you, Georgia. Well, I have pitched this to my editor and she said she liked it, but then she wrote me an email and said she had another idea. So I, and I haven't heard what that is and she probably doesn't want me to know what it is because I should be focusing on this book. But I was a real rock hound as a kid. <laughs> and, you know, rocks make the soil rock. rock. Oops, you, uh, rocks. you said rocks make the soil and then you went no, out. I'm thinking about, oh, rocks, just rocks. They're, they're a, a, a measure of time that's different for us. That would be a real fun thing to consider. Um, there's a book called The Good Ancestor that talks about geologic time. So this is not original with me by any means, but there are amazing rocks in the South. And I might, I might do a book on rocks. I don't know. We'll see. Awesome. Stay tuned. We were just talking to a, a geology professor about figuring out how to display a you know, geology garden, the oh, that no. same idea of, you know, plant blindness, but being able to kind of interpret 
you know, the limestone cuts we go through in Tennessee or things like yeah, that. Yeah, they're so amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just that history right there. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, we we tell the story of the ginkgo tree, you know, people thinking the ginkgo tree was lost to the fossil record, finding it in the rocks and then finding it alive, you know, Western scientists discovering it in you know Asia. Um, but that is like the rocks coming to life. But anyway, that, that sounds so exciting. Um, well, I think if unless there are closing words, I mean, I the opportunity to review. I mean, this has been an amazing conversation. I feel very lucky. You know, I thank our audience for being with us today. Um, thank you both for your time. Um, and again, you know, just to remind people, um, you know, of our books, we you have The Sea is Rising and So Are We by Cynthia Kaufman and then Saving the Wild South by George Ann Eubanks. Um, and uh, finally, there's a donate link in the chat and those donations help us to keep this great festival free. So please think about supporting um, our, our wonderful hosts. And again, thank you so much for your time today, Jordan and Cynthia. Um, Hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you, James. And thank you to Parnassus and the humanities. Yes, definitely. Yeah, this was super fun. I really appreciate the opportunity. Let's.